Hello. This week we're discussing cabotage laws with Dr. Sal Mercoliano and Mr. John Snyder. A cabotage law is the restriction of air, sea, or land transportation to a nation's own transportation services, normally within the national boundaries. The law we're discussing today is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, famously known as the Jones Act. Our guest, Dr. Sal Mercoliano, is an associate professor of history at Campbell University, an adjunct professor at the United States Merchant Marine Academy, and a former merchant mariner. Mr. Snyder is the editor of LNG World and Offshore Support Journal. All right, so uh, the Jones Act is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. So 100 years ago, June 5th, this past Friday, was the uh, centennial anniversary of the Jones Act. And one of the big issues regarding the Jones Act is a couple of things, obviously. Number one, it is a piece of legislation that is more than just cabotage, as it's usually associated with. Uh, the United States has had cabotage laws going back to this third law passed by the U.S. Congress that basically created a protected environment for U.S.-owned ships and U.S.-built ships to operate in the coastal trade. The, the Jones Act, I always argue, the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 is a holistic act. It actually looked at a whole variety of issues, and for the very first time in the history of the United States, it created a comprehensive maritime strategy for the United States. Uh, the United States found itself in 1920 in a very unique position. It just came out of World War I. And that conflict in particular highlighted the danger of the United States not having a domestic merchant marine. Uh, the U.S. in 1914 found itself neutral in a war that engulfed the world, and particularly it engulfed the major shipboard carriers, the British, the Germans, the Italians, uh, you name it. All of a sudden, all their shipping disappeared from our ports. And in August of 1914, the United States suffered a huge economic recession. All of a sudden, the, the, the cost to ship goods increased 20-fold because the British Merchant Marine was diverted to support the Allied effort. They, up, they, they contained half the world's shipping. The German Merchant Marine was the second largest in the world, had to flee the high seas to prevent being captured or sunk by the, by the British. And the U.S. fortunately had a coastal merchant marine. We were third in, in, in terms of tonnage, but we had a coastal merchant marine we could tap into. And we had to start using that coastal merchant marine not just for our trade, but also for international trade to move our goods. And it was those ships that got exposed to German attacks in 1917 when the Germans unleashed unrestricted submarine warfare. And we had to undertake a very hastily shipbuilding program in 1916, 1917 to start building tonnage. And really what happened is post-World War I, we realized, okay, we cannot be in that position again. There were, there were several issues at play there. And so the Jones Act, as it was passed in 1920, aimed to do protect the coastal trade, which had been the bedrock piece of legislation. And what's interesting is critics of the, of the Jones Act will always identify that's the key thing. And yet I've read the 2,000 pages of, of congressional testimony, and I think on, on, two, you know, on two hands I can count the amount of times they debated cabotage. Almost everything else dealt with everything in the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, particularly the selling of the war-built fleet. Uh, so that act created a sea lift, or I should say a maritime strategy, it created a, a, a maritime strategy. And what has happened over the past hundred years is the U.S. maritime strategy was, you know, like a house on legs. It's been, it was built on, a, you know, with certain underpinnings. And over time, those underpinnings have been slowly knocked away over time till we're at the point where we're really resting on three legs that keep the deep draft merchant marine, the 185 ships that Marriott identifies as deep draft ships remaining. There, there are 99 ships in the Jones Act trade. That is U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, uh, and, and U.S. crewed. Uh, there's the 60 ships in the maritime security program, and then there's cargo preference. That's really what keeps the U.S. merchant marine, the deep draft merchant marine afloat. Coastal trade, offshore vessels, tugs and barges, Great Lakes, they're also under that provision of Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act. And the issue at play here is, is, is why does the U.S. need the Jones Act, that's always the big issue. And, and, and uh, 
critics of the Jones Act will always say it's cost. It, it, it is much more expensive to hire Americans to build in the United States. And therefore, what happens is you escalate the cost to ship goods in the United States. And that's a valid argument. It is more expensive. The, you know, we're, it's more expensive to build in the United States. It's more expensive to employ Americans. One of the big things the Jones Act did, doesn't get talked about, is it codified the La Follette Seamen's Act of 1915. It protects American seamen from basically unjust treatment at sea. And so it is more expensive. But the thing that the Merchant Marine Act did that's most important, and it says it in the preamble, is it creates a merchant marine for time of war. Because like other nations of the war, we have a global commitment. We have military forces overseas. We found ourselves in peer-to-peer -peer conflicts time and time again. And we continually tap into that Jones Act trade for mariners to crew the reserve fleet and at times for ships to be pulled from the Jones Act to supplement the international trade. You know, if we, if we were Mexico, for example, Mexico is the 11th largest economy in the world. Mexico doesn't need a domestic merchant marine. They can suffice by using open registries and, and, and moving cargo that way because Mexico doesn't have a global footprint. They are not the world leader in certain areas. The United States is much different. And my argument for the Jones Act is always a national security argument. If we didn't need that national security element, then in many ways the Jones Act, we, we could be like other nations with that. And, and there are elements of the Jones Act that are, are – ripe for reform in some ways. I'm not a, a you know, some people are, are zealots to the Jones Act and some are zealots against it. I think we can have a conversation about it. The problem is that I've always seen with the Jones Act is that there are two sides, one's pro, one's anti, and never will the two meet or talk. And, and it, it, it's, it, it's really hard to get them to communicate. I'm an academic. I don't have a vested interest in it. So, you know, I'm not coming from the union side. I'm not coming in from it from an anti-Jones Act side. I look at it from a historical side. So that's my synopsis of the Jones Act there. I have a point of view from a person that doesn't live in the U.S. Uh, that uh, I, uh, I handle and I've talked to people in the maritime industry in the Caribbean, and I live in the Caribbean, and I, and I, I see externally uh, like uh, things that are directly affected by, by the Jones Act, uh, such as, for example, um, apparently Puerto Ricans love cheese. Okay? Mm -hmm. they, they buy it a lot. And um, so some people try to sell cheese to Puerto Rico. Turns out it costs more to get the cheese there than the actual cheese itself. Uh, in the meantime, Puerto Ricans, what they do is they go on cruise ships, they come to the Caribbean, and in order to skip that cost, they'll buy four or five wheels of cheese, take them back to, to Puerto Rico and resell them, paying for the cruise, for the cruise they went on, uh, in part anyways. And, uh, but but in, in the meantime, uh, people who want to export, other islands that want to export to Puerto Rico cannot because the, the cost is so prohibitive. And the other thing, the other thing that, that, uh, that I see from, from my point of view is that uh, the American uh, merchant marine industry is being propped up artificially. Like the, it's, not, it's, it's, uh, it's being artificially kept alive uh, by, uh, yeah, by this, by, by, by this law. Uh, it's, it's not, there's no competition, I don't think, um, you know, it's basically being bailed out every year uh, by, by this, if it wasn't for, for, for that act. And uh, I see how it affects the people on the island and uh, other people around it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I think, you know, when you look at the Jones Act, if you want to identify groups where the Jones Act has an impact, I would argue Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. I mean, without a doubt, Guam, uh, to a certain extent, it has an impact. And, and my point is there can be reforms to the Jones Act and, and to shipping in general that alleviate part of that. So, for example, one of the issues is it's very expensive, obviously, to operate U.S. ships. I mean, one of the biggest is crew costs right off the bat. So how do you reduce crew costs? Well, merchant mariners, have, you know, in, in both world wars, the merchant marine was nationalized. You know, basically, if you're in the merchant marine, congratulations, you're in the military now, you're sailing for us no matter what. And while that's far-fetched to some people today, it, it can always happen. And, and my opinion is, okay, how do you reduce those crew costs? You can subsidize it. And I hate throwing money at things. I think subsidizing turns into a, a, a tough business because the question is, well, who do you subsidize and who do you don't subsidize? I think one of the things you do is merchant mariners sailing on international, on, on, on unlimited tonnages, you, you waive their federal income tax, for example. That allows all of a sudden the, the, the operators to lower their, their gross costs for crews, for example. Uh, the companies that are sailing in, in Jones Act trade and international trade, there's only 29 companies that operate those 185 vessels. 
you can, especially in the Jones Act, which is even fewer, you can zero out their corporate tax rate. We're not talking about a huge amount of, of money here in terms of the federal government, but you can lower those costs right there to get that money down. Because I do think that, you know, it, it is more expensive, obviously, for Puerto Rico to import those goods. I think that's a very pertinent object to, to look at. I think on the flip side, too, you have to be careful about making the argument, hey, just get rid of the Jones Act. Puerto Rico then can be open to international trade. And, and my concern about that is, is if Puerto Rico is open to international trade, in other words, a, a foreign flagship, you know, you, you can get Mediterranean shipping company to, 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 to haul cargo out of the United States directly to Puerto Rico. They're going to do that on a route that takes them through the Panama Canal to Puerto Rico and to the United States, kind of back and forth. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to eventually, one company will dominate that trade. This is what we're seeing happening now is, is, is international shipping routes are being monopolized by these large conglomerates. You know, it's eight companies. I had oh. a question. It, it, might, it, might be, it might be a little like naive, but. No, no, go ahead. I don't, I don't know. Um, instead of doing that, uh, is it at all possible to uh, like right now? Right now, you have uh, you have American merchant ships with American sailors on board who are who are taking care of this. What about if you instead of getting rid of the Jones Act, you just allow any American with any passport, because most American sailors will get a Panamanian passport. So if you allow if you allow that, then there's more competition between between companies between sailors. I don't know if if that would work or not. Uh, well, the, the problem you have is the wages, and, and that, that's always been the issue, is American mariners make a lot. They, they really do. They're, they're very well compensated. They have a good leave policy. You know, we're seeing that now in COVID-19 where mariners on foreign flag vessels have been on board for nine to 12 months. That's not something you see on, on you know, the United States fought for a long time to get these good rights, and they did. And then post-World War II, you open up the Panamanian registry, Liberian registry, and, and, and that begins to change. And that's why it's very difficult. It, it is, it, it, it's such a hard argument to make for the American Merchant Marine because of that cost difference. That cost difference is so different, and, and it, it just drives up the cost. And, and my issue, let me, let me be clear, if we make the argument that the Merchant Marine is needed for national defense, then the U.S. government needs to do something to alleviate the burden on, on Americans if we got to have that ship, especially like in Puerto Rico, for example. I, I have this argument a lot. I, I talk with a lot of people that Puerto Rico, you know, you know, the Jones Act is strangling Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria is a classic example of that. When yeah. the hurricane came in and all this relief supplies were not being moved in, you know, my argument is, is with the U.S. military in, in Hurricane Maria. We, we Crowley and Tout dumped tons in, in San Juan, but they couldn't move it around the island. And what they needed was Navy and Army watercraft to move it around, and that didn't happen. And, and, and that was the biggest issue more than anything else. But, but you're right. It creates an environment that, that in some cases puts a, a burden on these islands. And, you know, Hawaii makes this argument a lot, too. Hawaii makes it, well, you know, it's so expensive to live in Hawaii. It's, yeah. it's, it's also the furthest place in the world to live from anywhere. You know, it's Hawaii. It's always yeah. going to be expensive to be there. So you're always going to drive costs up. Yeah, there's so got to be some kind of an out-of-the-box solution for all that. Right. Sorry, Matt. So, Sal, here, here's a question for you. You know, the U.S. isn't the only country in the world that has a cabotage law. You know, there are other countries. Why does it seem that the Jones Act receives a brunt of the attack when it comes to worldwide cabotage laws? You know, you do have, you know, foreign influence trying to take away the Jones Act here in the U.S. Meanwhile, you don't necessarily see that with cabotage laws in the U.K. or Nigeria. Right. Well, the big difference between the American cabotage laws and everybody else's is the U.S. build requirement. That, that throws a lot on it. And, and this is an argument I get into a lot about this because the U.S. build requirement was factored in by many things and it was impacted by many things. So, so opponents of Jones Act will love to bring out this slide that shows the decline of the U.S. Merchant Marine. And if you look in the 1960s, there's a big dip. And then there's in the 1980s and 90s, there's a big dip. And they say, well, look, Jones Act, that's the reason right there. It's the Jones Act. That's what does it. In truth, it, it's a variety of different things that caused it. So if you look at the 50s and 60s dip, that's being caused by the creation of the interstate highway system and the interstate pipeline system. Now, all of a sudden, you don't have to move goods by sea because I can put it on a truck or I can put uh, you know, oil and gas in a pipeline and ship it over. And oh, by the way, you have jet airliners now that take passengers off railways, and now railways can carry more freight than ever before. And, and so that's a big dip right there. 1980s, 
you have the end of, of, of the subsidies for international shipping, the end of the construction and, and, and uh, uh, shipbuilding differential subsidies. Uh, and while that doesn't apply to the Jones Act, what that did was a lot of builders who would build ships in the United States under those subsidies now go overseas and build their ships, which means there's less commercial ships to build in the U.S. yards. At the same time, the Navy closes its shipyards and moves its shipbuilding entirely into U.S. shipyards. And U.S. shipyards have got to take a decision, hey, am I going to build a couple of container ships or am I going to build 30 destroyers for the U.S. Navy, which, by the way, I can jack up the price and make a huge amount of money on. And so they become kind of inefficient in their building because they go with those U.S. government contracts. And, and what we do is we squeeze out, and that's what I mean by knocking the legs out of the underpinnings of the U.S. Merchant Marine. While that's not directly a Jones Act thing, it does impact the Jones Act. And, and, and I think that's one of the issues. Now, why we need shipbuilding in the United States, is, it should be fairly obvious, is, is again, if we're going to build a Navy, we should not have a domestic shipbuilding. Now, while building a container ship isn't the same as building a nuclear power Ford-class carrier, there are still some aspects of shipbuilding that translate between commercial and, uh, and military. And while we don't have that requirement for tanks and trucks and airplanes, Boeing and Lockheed are fairly newer creations, and we always dominated the aviation industry. There was never a point when we didn't dominate the aviation industry. There was never a part, a point when we didn't dominate the auto making, you know, industry. And you know, critics of the Jones Act will sit there and say, "Well, look, you know, you know, foreign cars are now built and brought into the United States. You know, that competition was good." And I always go back to, really, was 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 foreign competition good for the big three car? companies in the 1970s you produce the vega the cricket and the pinto that's the, you know that's what came out and and you know the us just by sheer numbers and, and requirement that everybody has to have at least one car in the united states creates an artificial demand that's not exactly the same sorry i can run on about this that's okay mr snyder we haven't heard anything from you yet yeah actually thank you uh so i, I had a question in regards to do you think the jones act could play a part in the post-COVID-19 recovery? I think there's an interesting argument being made about the Jones Act today in, in, in this requirement. I mean, one of the things we saw very early on, for example, was the shutdown of yards in China, for example, because of, because of COVID. And, you know, with the implementation of IMO 2020, that had a massive ramification on ships being able to get in there, get the scrubbers installed or refitted. And, you know, again, if, if you look at where ships are being built now, 90.5% of all ships are built in China, Korea, and Japan right now. And that puts a, you know, that puts all the world shipbuilding in one kind of very geographic spot on the planet. And again, we saw the limitations on the logistics system. You know, we operate on a just in, just out logistics system. As long as everything's moving nicely, it works great. The minute you create that hiccup in it, the minute, you know, the minute all of a sudden there's a disruption, it's like when your power goes out in your house, all of a sudden you look there, it's like, what do I do? You know, that disruption we saw, you know, when I remember in, in, I was doing a, a, a class and I told students, okay, in about four or five weeks, things are going to get bad here because everything's shut down in China and that's going to have an impact down the supply chain. And I think there'll be an impetus now to sit there and say, do we really want, you know, we, we can't be self-isolated. We can't have all our goods carried on U.S. ships. That's, that's impossible. It's an impossible It's already thing. happening, right? Well, it, it, it's, we have to operate in this international environment. It, it's impossible to, to, to lock ourselves out. But I do think that there's an impetus, John, for us to sit there and say, okay, maybe having a, a, a backup, a reservoir, a, a, a cushion of some kind is what we need. That was the argument in 1920. That was the exact argument they sat there and said, if we didn't have that cushion, if we didn't have that Jones Act, which wasn't in place at the time, but if we didn't have that cabotage fleet, we'd have been in a lot of trouble in World War I. We wouldn't have been able to move the troops, get the supplies, and defeat them. Same thing in World War II in many ways. And while, you know, I, I don't see World War III on the horizon, what I could, what I do conceive of is a conflict in East Asia, maybe not involving us, but maybe with China or Korea or Japan or Taiwan or something, how does that disrupt the trade all of a sudden if a regional war breaks out in East Asia? We're not in it, we, we're staying neutral, but all of a sudden our trade is disrupted. And we're dependent on all those countries for our goods, our commerce, and the movement of our goods and commerce. 
So yeah, I, I do think COVID is, 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 is a bit of a wake up though. The problem is always do Americans wake up from that and do they learn from history? I'm a history, I'm a history teacher. And, and one of my greatest, uh, uh, you know, things I bank on is the fact we don't learn from history because I got to keep reteaching it time and time and time again. No, it's job security. <laughs> no, <we don't. laughs> I guess as a follow-up to that, uh, Sal, um, you know, there was some noise in Congress about perhaps uh, reserving some LNG cargoes for U.S. flag LNG carriers. Of course, uh, an LNG carrier hasn't been built in the U.S. Uh, since the 1980s. Right. Uh, I guess the last being up in um, Quincy. Uh, and then I guess the uh, kind of the aborted uh, uh, tanker or carriers down in at Avondale. Um, any, any thoughts on that? I, do you think, uh, you know, supporting a uh, an LNG carrier new building program uh, in the U.S. would is something that's viable. Yeah, I, matter of fact, I've written about this. I've put a couple of articles out on GCAP about this. You know, if, if there is a Jones Act waiver that 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 is primed to be made, I would argue it's it's LNG. And and one of the things I you know, and but I'm not one to sit there and say, okay, let's let's let LNG you know let's get LNG carriers in here and start hauling LNG. What I, my argument about this is, is reflagging in some LNG carriers. You're right. I mean, we built LNG carriers. One of my biggest arguments with, with people who argue against this is we can't build them. Like, yes, we can. We did in the 70s and 80s. We can do it. We built 13 of them. We, we can definitely do this again. But one of the things I would argue is, okay, if we build, you know, reflag in some LNG carriers. I mean, Qatar just made that huge contract with Korea to build, you know, a god awful amount of them and, and a huge amount of money. You know, bring them in, but, you know, let's put a, a surcharge, not a huge amount, but a surcharge on those, you know, LNG being carried on foreign carriers. Use that to stock a, a Title 11 shipbuilding program that we put a limit on five to 10 years on these foreign flag, these foreign built LNGs. They got to be replaced out one for one, you know, and, and that money can be used or by that point, hopefully we'll show the profitability and someone will be wanting to invest in this. And we start building LNG carriers in the United States. You know, those LNG carriers will have to do repairs in the United States. You know, we put that provision in there. You get experience with that and you start building on that. Again, I, I think we're missing a, a huge opportunity. Now, also, it's important to remember, we didn't start exporting LNG until 2016 and when all of a sudden fracking turned us into the largest LNG producer next to Qatar. And, and so, it's, you know, it, the idea that the U.S. Merchant Marine is, is all of a sudden behind the curve on this isn't exactly true. There was no demand to export LNG from the United States before we started hitting it all. I, I think one of the things that's going on right now in the midst of COVID-19 was the effort by OPEC and Russia to bottom out the oil industry in the United States. I, I mean, if, if, if you watch what they did, they are, they're trying to bankrupt the shale industry in the United States. They're flooding the U.S. market with cheap gas right now so that the shale market disappears in the United States. That means oil, LNG disappears. And then they, you know, we would be dependent on importing that oil over. And I think the shale industry, when they went for LNG waivers, did not explain that very well to the maritime industry. And I actually think the maritime industry, in a way, missed an opportunity there to work. And the problem is the maritime industry has been so ingrained. Each of the different areas are so stove, stovepiped, the, the, the unions, the shipbuilders, the ship owners, that that. Anytime they see, a, you know, a, a crack in something, they think it's the chasm getting ready to devour them, which they need to be careful of. I, I'm 100% I, I understand that. There, there's reason to be afraid of that. But I also think as, as someone who looks at the industry from the outside without a vested interest in it, they need to be thinking ahead. There needs to be reform to be made or else they're going to keep that downward trend going without reform of some kind. I think that's very important. Is there a... Is there a a concerted effort at all. I don't. Um, I don't know if there is or not. Uh, to make uh, the U.S. Merchant Marines more competitive, and basically, in instead of instead of uh, instead of keeping everybody in and trying to protect and to you know to to basically to make it more competitive, drop the prices a little bit, and and uh, I guess uh, make more use of it in the region. Yeah. Well, I, th th there's a concerted effort to get the Jones Act repealed. I, I mean, so there, there, there are groups like uh, the Cato Institute and ADI who are funded to, to make arguments about this and, 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 and to just, you know, knock down the barriers and, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, 
And, and my argument about that is you'll get short-term benefits, but it's going to have long-term implications down the road. And I, I think that's a dangerous for aspect. national security, right? For, for, for national security. And I also think for, for actually for the economy too. Like, like I said, my, my concern, so for example, Matson and Pasha are the, are the services that go to Hawaii. They, 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 they service the island of Hawaii. And there's an argument that's made if you, if you remove the Jones Act, well, then those big, huge, massive container ships that sail across the Pacific will call it Hawaii and put it on their scheduled routes as they go between, Hawaii, the, as be, they go between China, Hawaii to the West Coast. Well, no. First off, they go way, way far north of Hawaii anyway. It's going to be a diversion to get into Hawaii. And second of all, whatever, in the, whatever group comes in is going to dominate that trade. And I find it very hard to believe that they're going to undercut each other to the point where they're not going to charge maybe just a little bit less than what Matson and Posh is going to pay. They, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to charge freight a penny above what the minimum people pay. What, what they pay, what they charge is a penny below what their competitors are going to charge. That's, that's the way the shipping industry works. And, and my concern is then now all of a sudden you're dependent on these foreign carriers to come in and, and move the cargo. And, and again, in time of conflict or emergency, you don't have the U S flagships and more importantly you don't have the US mariners to do it. You know, Kings Point and, and, and SUNY Maritime, they're pumping out mariners like crazy. We're always going to have third engineers and third assist and, and third mates. But we're not going to have our seconds and firsts and 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 chiefs and captains. And, and that's where we're going to come up short one day. And and so the group you would expect to be the one who is like in the forefront advocating this is a group like the Maritime Administration. You would expect them to do it. And, and I go back to, you know, they just had the National Maritime Day and they had a great video they put out with, with Mike Rowe from Deadly's Catch and Dirty Jobs on it. And, and his quote, and it is the one I agree 100%, is, is, is the maritime industry, you, you guys have a terrible PR problem. We do. We, we don't, no one knows what the Mer Merchant Marine does, what the maritime industry does, <laughs> because it's so segmented away locked off and and we do a terrible job of telling people that i was always I, I always have this analogy at the end of world war ii uh the merchant marine provided the link you know from the arsenal of democracy to the battlefield and at the end of world war ii the united states army published a 79 volume series on what the u.s army did in world war ii it's great it's massive big huge massive volume books they're great 79 volumes 79 volumes the united states merchant marine published 81 81 pages that's it it's an 81 page book <laughs> and 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 it, you know that's it and, and it's completely subsumed by everything else so yeah. i think you know when, when you talk about is there anything being done i think there needs almost to be a shark tank style maritime invent investment that's you know, interesting they, they, there's there's cash out there the problem is Maritime guys talk to maritime guys. They talk great. You know, shipping guys talk to shipping guys. They, they're great. They don't talk outside very well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I like to do is, is sit there and say, okay, I'm a bridge. I, I was a mariner. I, I understand this industry, but I can also talk to the outside and get this information out. And, and that's why people are, are loath to invest. It's because, well, we don't understand the maritime industry. You guys, you know, boats and, you know, I don't understand it, but, but there's huge profit. I mean, man, if, if, if I had money, I would have bought every VLCC I could get my hands on, shares of which at the beginning of the year, because because we saw that coming, like crazy, you know. Because there's money to be had, you know. You may it may not be an investment. Shipping is not an investment that you'll make two percent every quarter on. You'll lose money for four years, and then in one quarter you make all your money you'll make for twenty years, and and, and you just got to be in it at that point to to make that money. And I think that's the that's the issue that's not sold very well. I think that's what has hurt the maritime industry for a long time. And I have a question for you, Sal. How sure. much have the past recent few years presidential Jones Act waivers uh, in response to national crises affect the argument on preserving the Jones Act? Well, you know, I, th I think the waivers which tend to happen during times of emergency, you know, natural disasters of some kind, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that, that happens is the maritime industry, again, doesn't come out very well to explain those waivers. They attack the waivers, you know, you know, can't have a waiver, can't do it, can't, can't, can't do it. So for example, New England, you get hit by a massive snowstorm and now all of a sudden rock salt has to be hauled up. And, 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 you know, people are like, oh, we had to charter a ship from, you know, Bolivia to come and, and haul rock salt. What's not done is like, hey, we hauled 50 loads of rock salt on ships every year. It's just we needed one more load than we had factored in this past year. 
and and we don't do a good job of of explaining it. What you what should be done is like okay, this should be impetus now is hey, we need more ships. That we need to make that argument. You know, when when a waiver comes in, it's like that's because there's a deficiency in the merchant marine, and what we need to do is not bring in foreign ships, but we need to build more ships. We need to invest in that infrastructure. Uh, the other problem is that sometimes those Jones Act waivers are seen as mechanisms for breaking down that barrier. So for example, Hurricane Maria, one of the ships that was given, there, there was a 10-day period during Hurricane Maria and 10 ships came in, I think it was 10, 10 or 12 came in to bring in relief supplies. Well, one of the ships that brought in relief supplies was a cruise ship. And my argument is, okay, hang on, how many relief supplies is a cruise ship going to really bring in? You know, it's going to bring in pallets of food and yeah, it's great. It's, it looks good for, for Royal Caribbean or whoever's doing it. It looks really nice and it's good, but it's, it, is that really a container ship bringing 3000 boxes of relief supplies or is, is, you know, and that's, that's the, the, the argument right there. You know, do you need emergency shipment of fuel? Hey, the Southern end of Puerto Rico doesn't have gas. We need to get it in there. Let's get a tug and barge and move it in there. You know, that's, that's an issue. Again, it goes back to the central PR issue that, that the maritime industry does a terrible, terrible job of, of, of getting their press out. I was going to be up in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Maryland this past March for the American Merchant Marine Veterans Association. I was going to talk about the Merchant Marine in World War II. And, and that little report I told you about, I, I had a link to the webpage on Marriott. It was broken. So you couldn't even bring up, you know, the, you couldn't even bring up the 81 pages because it, it, it was just not maintained. And, and I think that's the, one of the big issues is, is when those waivers come out, there's a reason behind it. And what needs to be talked about isn't just that this is allowing a foreign ship in, but it should be used to convey the issue that w there's a deficiency in the American merchant marine. Let's fix that. And what do we need to address it? Instead, it's, you're, you're in my rice bowl. I don't want you touching it. And, and so we get very defensive, I think, as opposed to being offensive. That's a very nice symbolic thing right there. Yeah, you went to go look for the information and the link was broken. Like yeah, literally was... and figuratively. Mr. Snyder, I had a question for you. Um, so with this whole thing about cabotage and everything like, like that, uh, is it not like is it is it not uh, is it not a, a viable solution to eventually introduce uh, autonomous barges between domestic uh, um, ports such as uh, Hawaii and uh, uh, California and things like that? Did you want me to answer that or or Sal? Yeah, you've been you, yeah you've you've been quiet, so I'm, I'm throwing it to you. <laughs> 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 well, I, I was going to say there, you know, certainly the technology is, is advancing for autonomous vessels, but I, I think that's, it's, it's still quite a way, a ways off. Um, I think you might start seeing autonomous vessel use in, in applications where, for example, uh, perhaps smaller vessels, you know, for firefighting, uh, where you can um, safeguard your workers from any harm. Uh, so you have uh, an oil spill, the same uh, type of uh, these small vessels responding and perhaps controlled from a, a, a mother vessel uh, from a safe distance by, by person. But I think autonomous vessels are, are quite a ways off um, uh, as yet, but certainly a good thought. Okay. No, I was looking at uh, I was looking at the new uh, the new uh, cargo trucks from Tesla, and uh, it's and and uh, there was some news a while back about China doing a little something with uh, with uh, autonomous uh, vessels as well at sea. So I thought I thought maybe there was some some advances I had not heard of that you guys knew about. <laughs> there's uh, there's actually a, a cargo vessel uh, that's been uh, well, it's now been delayed, but they they were building uh, a company called Yara. Uh, and it's a, I believe it's a Norwegian company, and it was going to be uh, to undertake an autonomous uh, route uh, delivering, uh, I believe it was uh, fertilizer. Yeah. So uh, it's in a coastal operation, um, but uh, that, that construction has been delayed by, by COVID. But they expect to deliver, I think, uh, by next year. Yeah, you would expect th there was a big talk about it, impetus for it because of COVID, because of getting the crews off ships and and, and that element. Oh, yeah. the, the the issue you have, and 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 the Navy's figuring this out because they're big on on autonomous vessels right now and doing it is the uplink, is the control for them because they're really not autonomous. They they, they need an uplink. They need to be communicating. It's not completely unlocked because because I, I don't think you're going to find anyone to insure a vessel 
let it off the dock and well, let's hope it shows up across the Pacific, you know, because I, I don't think anybody's going to ensure that at all. And, and, and that's been the issue. And then when you look at cyber attacks, what, what Maersk suffered back in 2017, what MSC suffered just recently, I, I think the cyber issue makes autonomy a, a, a different. I think you're going to see less and less crew. I think that's the, the, the trend we're seeing on the vessels, which is, you know, but I, I almost find it almost impossible for cargo ships to be completely by themselves without at least some human being on board them. It's going to be really tough. To oh, no, of course, happen. it's going to be token crew. What I I, know I got the flag a little second ago, and and to, and to, <laughs> we got to end it. But I want to add like one question I really wanted to put to you. Um, did, did you guys hear anything at all about this uh, Russian uh, oil vessel that ended had a spill uh, just uh, like a, a week ago or a few days ago or something like that? Uh, like because we're not getting much information about that down here. So is there any any thoughts on that? It was up in the Arctic and it had a, a substantial spill from, from what I've seen in the images is pretty horrific. I mean, it, it's pure oil that running down the rivers there, but I haven't heard anything on the cleanup. I haven't seen too much with it. What I saw was coming out of, I can't remember where it came out of, but it was up in the Siberia region. So it was up in their Northern Arctic region where they lost the, uh, lost the oil. And again, one of the things that the, 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 the Russians are pushing is this Northeast passage, right. you know, and, and they, they really want that to be a commercially viable, route to to operate you know they're, they're they're competing against the canadians and largely for the northwest passage and you know the chinese want that a lot too because that, that that frees them the chinese are very concerned one of the reasons why you see them going in the south china sea into the indian ocean is to protect that trade route they have to protect that secure s supply line this goes back to the zheng he in the 13th century the chinese are always concerned about their their supply routes and and that supply route is particularly concerned. The, the Russians have got to be able to keep it clear. They have the icebreakers to do it, but but this spill is going to be a big factor in it. So I haven't heard too much more about it besides that we know it does happen. Right. Yeah. You guys got to come back. <laughs> I was I was just going to say uh, just a quick uh, comment on that. Of course, also they're using uh, the northern shipping route for LNG as well. Yep. So looking to to make their Yamal project um, uh, expand there trade with with the uh, Asia and China. And, and if you think about it, it, op it, it frees you from choke points in the South China Sea, the Malacca Straits, the, the Gulf of Aden, you know, uh, Bab el Mandab, the Suez, Gibraltar. I mean, it's amazing. It really, I mean, it just for the Chinese it's, it's, it, and the Russians, it's a game changer of ultimate proportions. You, the only strait or area of, of choke point you go through is between Alaska and, and Siberia there in the Bering Sea. And if they can make that operational, it, it gives them the flexibility that they want to move goods. It's actually shorter too. Well, I started out with two questions and ended up with 50 that I want to, want to ask still, but I don't have time anymore. Um, Sal, you know what, there's one last question for you. Sure. You know, you, you mentioned the, the Northeast path, Passage, Northwest Passage, you know, Alaska obviously borders up on that route. How well would trade from Northern part, ports in Alaska covering that passage be under the Jones Act? Well, I mean, that, that would be an interesting element right there, obviously, because one of the routes that doesn't get talked about right now is, is, is how many vessels pass Dutch Harbor, for example, heading up to uh, you know, the transatlantic route, the Great Circle route from the West Coast over. So, you know, uh, port stays, fueling operations, you know, it's still long transit. And so it, it could impact the Alaska trade quite a bit. It would be a factor that, that would be considered in there. You know, it, it would change, the, you know, as, as the Earth's geography changes because of global warming and, and the, the, the decline of the Arctic ice pack, uh, it's going to open up those issues. You know, the warmest summer or warmest year in, in history was Alaska last year. You know, we had 68 degree temperature in wintertime up there. It was ridiculous. And so that's going to really change the environment. And, and it's an you know, it, there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity for trade all of a sudden. And ports that normally don't get factored in, Nome, Juno, uh, Anchorage, now all of a sudden become viable. It, it's why Ted Stevens Airport in Alaska is one of the busiest airports in, in the world. It, because it's on that great circle route. You know, planes have been able to, to use this. And I should also mention that Ted Stevens is one of the, the exemptions under the Jones Act that exists in that you can move cargo between non-US planes at Ted Stevens is one of the exemptions in there. It's not the Jones mm. Act specifically, but it's, but it's on aviation. And so it'd be interesting, you know, if you created an international terminal up there somewhere, you know, and become the Singapore, the Dubai, the Rotterdam, the, the Algeciras, you know, is there an opportunity to create a, an international handling port up there? 
to move cargo, you know, when that cargo comes from the north and it comes between Russia and, and Alaska, you know, if you had an international port right there, if you think about it, you would have feeder ships that can explode into the Pacific, head to the west coast, head south, head along that way. It, 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 there's an opportunity there. And you would have to make that port a unique port, obviously. So I, I think I think it's one of the things that's not being talked about enough, but it's definitely something that, that may be on the horizon. That's really great. John, Sal, I really want to thank you guys for helping us out th with this. Uh, it's been a great talk, a lot of great information. You're welcome. I appreciate the invite. Yeah. Nice. Hey, thanks a lot. I mean, I have so many questions. I don't even know where to start, but I hope you guys come <laughs> back so we can so we can get at least ten percent of them, you know, answered. <laughs> Uh, but thanks a lot for coming on and I hope you guys see you guys on again.